welcome back. You're watching and listening to Breakfast with Anne and Mark, and we're looking at freezing cold headlines, basically. Not very nice, is it? Should we have a look Actually, it's a bit papers? more than that. It's snow and ice chaos in the run-up to Christmas. I know, yeah, but it is in the mail. Um, let's take a look at today's front pages, shall we? That'll bring me trouble, won't it? The Sunday Times focuses on England's heart-wrenching defeat to France last night in the World Cup. Well, Sunday Express says uh, au revoir Qatar, as, or should have been Tata Qatar, shouldn't it, really? Oh, that would be better. Uh, yes, ish. and uh, they are obviously... Reflecting on last pain. night, yeah. Sun on Sunday does the same thing, looking at Harry's pain. Eating his shirt as a result. In the Telegraph, England's defeat making the headlines too, but attention also drawn to Labour's commitment to taking on the hostile health unions, as they say, uh, in terms of NHS reorganisation. A page of the Observer says health unions could suspend industrial strikes if ministers agree to serious discussions over pay. And that's the big question, I think, facing everybody today. Let's go through the papers uh, once more in uh, detail with both uh, Tom and Mary Ann. Thank you for being with us once more. And we are... Starting with Tom in yeah, the mirror. The mirror. And she Rishi. strikes a snub. Yes. So this is uh, Mick Lynch accusing the Prime Minister of torpedoing talks. Um, there's always been this kind of pantomime throughout all of this kind of whole process, hasn't there, when you've had the RNT and the, the railway unions saying that really this is a political negotiation, yet there's always this kind of hiding behind whether it's the rail companies or whether it's the ministers at the Department of Transport. And Sunak is clearly not willing to be seen to be kind of sitting around the table for the government to be more formally engaging with this. And if anything is going in the opposite direction, which was last Lynch week. Lynch actually wanted a meeting with Rishi Sunak, mm. didn't he? he? He was actually challenging him as such. Exactly. And, and things have escalated to a very high level. You, this Ultimately, of course, this is something which is obviously in Rishi Sunak's intro, but at the same time wanting to maintain that kind of pretense that that's not the case. And if anything, Sunak's heading in the other direction, talking about very punishing new restrictions on trade unions on the right to strike going even further than our laws currently which are pretty restrictive in terms of the European average so it doesn't seem like um, Mick Lynch is going to get his wish <laughs> so far I mean, if was anything it a snub, that or did Rishi simply say love to talk to you but talk to my minister first well like, essentially he's um, I think he wants to be seen to be being tough on the unions naturally he doesn't want to be seen to be kind of sitting around the table with them and as you say from what we saw last week talking about some of the things that he's talking about bringing in are pretty extreme as far as things like a kind of minimum service sound very non-controversial, but that's effectively kind of compelling people to cross picket lines in order to yeah. maintain that service. So it's very significant. But as we all know, for political as well as um, economic reasons, as Rishi Sunak would, would see it, he doesn't want to be seen to be giving in at this particular point. So at the moment, still sort of... Nothing's still happening. that stalemate, definitely. Yeah. 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 Tuesday, the first strike helpful, is coming week, isn't, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure... Literally two weeks ago, I was sitting in this very seat looking at one of the stories in the newspaper that suggested that maybe Number 10 would invite the union leaders round for beer and sandwiches to kind of discuss things like, you know, proper people round a table and kind of harking back again to how they eventually solved the, the kind of the 1970s strike eras. And um, there's a bit of me that wonders whether these stories get kind of leaked out and then there's a sort of, you know, they take the, the pulse of the nation to see whether we approve of tea and sandwiches or whether we approve of a hard line or whether we approve of talking tough or whether we approve of meeting nurses and, you know, making friends. And, and I, I, I kind of think that I, I quite like our politicians to inform themselves of the issues and then make good decisions rather than sort of throw it I out to some kind of like popularity all contest. the time at the moment, don't you? Well, it becomes a pantomime, like Tom says. Mm. They well, keep I, leaking I, I, out, They keep sort of leaking out little bits or hinting at, mm. at possible legislation in the future, and you can't help think we're just being tested. Or, or is it also the case to see how frustrated we get with all the industrial unrest? Mm. Will that turn mm. us against the unions, perhaps, the government may, may think? So they're playing a waiting game. Uh, mm. Quite cynical. Uh, view on it, but you've you've gone for the Telegraph's take on this, Marianne, because this is slightly different. This is actually Labour now coming into the the sphere of industrial relations, which is also very interesting mm. because obviously historically Labour and the unions are aligned and as strongly support one another. And so add beer and sandwiches together, as you said. There yeah. you go. Uh, so this is um, Wes Streeting, who is the uh, Shadow Health Minister, and he 
personally has been waiting for months for scans after cancer treatment and has said that he has said publicly that he gets incredibly frustrated that whenever he talks about the lack of access to primary care so for example how long you might have to wait how difficult it is to get a gp appointment for example he gets positioned as being against the NHS or attacking GPs. And he said, no, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying is that we need better standards for patients. It's, it's quite interesting that he's writing in the Telegraph, which is generally a, a right-leaning paper. Graph, the Tory like graph, yeah. indeed. And can he's... You can you imagine how frustrated he must be? And I'll bet your relatives, knowing that he is awaiting cancer treatment, mm. are probably saying, why don't you just go private? Well, that's the thing, isn't and it? And as that... a Labour minister, he can't. Labour shadow. I, well, I mean, the thing is, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of respect for someone who says, I'm not going to do that because... Mm. On principle, mm. I'm against that because so many people can't but just go private minded. and put it on the credit Didn't card. Dennis Healy yes. was part of your yes. interview when yes. you and, because uh, I pointed out that his wife had, had treatment. It, it, his wife had opted for private treatment, yeah. um, which he said, of course, it was her right to do. But he had just absolutely excoriated Margaret Thatcher for having private treatment on her on hand. hand. That's right. Mm. Yeah. And that's what caused the whole row. But I, I just think here, you can only imagine cancer. I mean, for heaven's sake, cancer. Mm. He must be so tempted to go private mm. that he could probably have it done within weeks and, or and, have and had would, it done already. And would that then eventually mean less pressure on the NHS well, because he'd, he would have to have less treatment. In fact, in didn't the chief executive of Bupa say in a television interview yesterday, he said, actually, if you can afford to go private or you've got private health insurance through your yeah. work, you're actually relieving the stress on the NHS yeah. if you do. I think that's a very, very slippery slope, though, because that's like saying send your children to private school because then it'll stop, you know, chronically underfunded state schools from collapsing. And well, you go, well, actually, well, that was, it does, doesn't that, it? That, well, that was no, part of the argument the, that the, the Tory party of course, was putting the NHS, on uh, but the AT not being taken off... Uh, a, you're you're just bolstering a private yeah. healthcare, so an alternative, a sort of two-tier service. It doesn't take away from the state service, does it? It does if you get a premium per pupil or per patient, because what you end up doing is people with what are described as comorbidities, so people who have more complex, longer-term or multiple chronic health conditions who can't afford to go privately end up having to wait and be served by an utterly collapsed, utterly underfunded, um, talent-sapped NHS, talent-sapped yeah. education system, and you end up with this kind of... Uh, we, we end up being in a situation with the US. OK, now you touched on the education system. You spotted something in The Observer as well, Tom, um, on higher education particularly. The decline of working-class people in the arts. Mm. So this is some really striking statistics here. So it's from the Office for National Statistics. It's pointed out that people from a working class background in the arts and the creative industries, um, it's fallen to just 7.9%. Um, so is, as recently as 1962, it was about 16.4. Uh, and there have been kind of shifts in demographics and social classes and so on, but still representing a really quite clear underrepresentation, which you also see reflected in things like journalism and the media, of course. Which Doesn't it then beg the question of the definition of what is working class? I mean, since, you know, uh, all those plays in the 1960s of John Osborne, etc. You know, the, the whole thing has shifted in terms mm -hmm. of social demographics. I mean, that's very true, and, uh, and obviously, I think people think back to the kind of eras of kind of uh, 50s and 60s cinema and so on. Yeah. You know, kind of Saturday night and Sunday morning. Obviously, that's that world that's doesn't well, exist yeah. anymore. Yeah. But at the same time, there are still people who are living, working, pay, living paycheck to paycheck, come from um, not necessarily particularly well-off backgrounds, and yet they're not making it through to the kind of upper echelons of the creative industries in the way that we saw previously. You've even seen kind of popular culture quite colonised by the middle class in a way that we hadn't necessarily seen previously. And you do, I, th I think, therefore, it's not so much of a surprise that when something like Brexit comes along, the media don't see it coming. And, the, and one thing they talk about here is that, essentially, the only roles that exist for working class actors of working class writers' story seems to be poverty porn on one end. So there's that kind of discussion of people only ever as these kind of people on the breadline. That's one victims. story you can tell as victims. And the one thing I would add is <coughs> either that or they're kind of seen as these kind of, they're either the benighted or the bigots, I think, in our kind of conversation. That's, That's another quite interesting natural series, portrait. The benighted and the bigots. Exactly. I'm going to trademark that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, who, who is the, uh, the fabulous black actor in the new Star Wars movies? 
John Boyega. Yeah, John Boyega, yeah. John Boyega who was uh, um, in a, brought up in. Um, uh, Beckham, sort of I think. Sink estate yeah. in London or something, managed to get into the theatre because his mother was so worried about him joining a gang that she managed to get him interested into one of these theatres um, in, uh, in London and look at his careers taken off. And he said, if it wasn't for that theatre group, it was just a pretty, what you might call a working class theatre, mm -hmm. local theatre group, um, you know, he wouldn't have been the person he is today. So there is, a, you, know, you can always say as well in the arts, because mm -hmm. it requires on, it, the, the arts require raw talent, don't mm. they? And you should, Maybe a lot of people think that that will always come through. It has to be hungry. Yeah. It needs hunger to come through. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. we're talking about the 60s, of course, it was Michael Caine and that, and that particular generation yeah. who really started it. And, mm -hmm. and they were all in demand because everyone was making films with sort of, you know, Alfie and all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah. I think anyway. to some extent, though, there might be just people not in the mainstream, in those big sort of arts entities. You know, they might not be, uh, um, you know, the, the ENO or, or the BBC, they're doing their own thing. They're on TikTok or YouTube. That's they're self-publishing. Yeah, because media. they go, yeah. those, are, those big institutions are utterly irrelevant to me yeah, and yeah. my, that's my group. Yeah, very but that's, that's a shame. That's, that's a, Make I mean, your own TikTok that's kind video of, and just get it out there. It's yeah. a failing of the arts industry then because they should be in the mainstream. Discuss. Mm. Right, OK, what are we going to next? Um, oh, you've, you've spotted this... Um, uh, we, we talked about the health problems, but this is a, a good health story you've spotted in the Express. And this is a new therapy that's cleared this girl's uh, leukaemia. Yeah, this is amazing. Good news story, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, this is Alyssa from Leicester, um, 13. She was diagnosed with a very, very aggressive form of acute uh, lymphoma. Uh, sorry, le leukemia, and um, she's been given, she's the first person in the whole world to be given this uh, genetic edited cell treatment. So what they do basically is they take T cells from a healthy donor, yeah. uh, so they're the, the cells that fight yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the bad stuff in your, in your body. Um, and at the, uh, Alyssa was, had a situation where the cancer was basically attacking her own body and attacking her own T cells. So they took T cells from a different healthy donor, they gene edited them wow. so that they had an invisibility cloak so they wouldn't be attacked yeah, by the T please. cells, they could attack other T cells and they wouldn't attack Alyssa's body as a foreign entity. Wow, where was this done? And then millions of cells, uh, she was given millions of these cells um, in, a, in a transfusion or series of transfusions. Great Ormond Street, Professor Wasim Kasim and Jan Chu, who's the senior research nurse, wow. said that this is this next. Up. I mean, that sounds revolutionary. It's re it sounds kind of sci-fi and it's absolutely amazing science that's being spearheaded by teams of people in so, the UK and overseas. So and no chemotherapy, no steroids. Oh, all, no, no, all no, she's had all that stuff right, as well. As well no, okay. all that stuff as well she needs um, ongoing treatment she needs another bone marrow transplant uh, to basically, but this is basically start again the, it, but, so it's cured something that be, before now has been seen as being incurable well this she was at a situation where if this tr line of treatment didn't work this radical revolutionary experimental scientific treatment didn't work then she would be offered end-of-life care because that's oh the only thing that, that you know they would have made her comfortable oh uh, well done everybody at she's so, so she's not out of the woods no. but in terms of it but working it's, a major step forward. it's absolutely incredible this technology was only invented this type of treatment was only invented six years ago and Great Ormond Street flying the flag, for which is, oh. is wonderful. Yeah. So and, uh, all, all uh, power to them. And Professor Wasim Kassem, a consultant immunologist uh, as brilliant, well. Brilliant. So if you've got well. youngsters sitting at home going, I want to do sci-fi science, then this is yes. the kind of stuff they could Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And we it's won't really wish cool. her the very best. Yeah. Uh, and Enjoy uh, Christmas. Well, <laughs> thank you for, for ending on an uh, upbeat story. That's what we needed, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that's it with you, isn't it? We're mm -hmm. not going to see you again. Oh, is that yeah. it? Are you that's in next weekend? Right. I don't know. Depends yes, on, yes, I think I am. Depends on actually. the weather. Don't know whether yeah. to see you. <laughs> 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 Happy Christmas anyway. Thanks. Happy Christmas anyway. I think we can say that since 